Can you guys hear me now? Let's see if you guys can hear me. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Awesome. That was weird. Um, yeah, that was really weird. The mic. Thanks, you guys. Okay. Yeah, the mic, like, um, OBS was um, not picking up the microphone at all. Um, so I'm not sure what that was all about. It was saying that it couldn't um, access my Yeti, which is really strange. So um, anyhow, sorry about that, you guys. I appreciate your patience. Um, I was doing yarn statistics and whatnot, and I was um, doing some, like, and I just lost track of time. And then all of a sudden, it was like 1059. And I had to, um, like, run in here and, like, start the stream right away. So I was feeling a little bit frazzled when I started. And then, of course, you know, some technical issues. So welcome to hundred and to episode 140. Um, my, uh, my name's Rachel. You guys know who I am. I can be found pretty much everywhere as well for Pearls. I am most active on Ravel. on Instagram. I am a bit touch and go with Instagram. It's mostly just because I find that um, I I don't, if I have time to spend on social media, the I don't tend to go to Instagram. I tend to go to the Slack channel so that I can keep up to date with what you guys are chatting about and what you're doing. So um, Instagram is sort of sometimes a little bit um, hit and miss. Um, Welcome. So welcome to those who are new to the show. I'm sorry for the, the sound issues at the beginning. We, it's it, more often than not, we seem to have sound issues at the problem at, at the beginning of the uh, live stream. I'm not sure if it's just, it's obviously my error and, and user error, but it just seems to be sort of something that um, maybe one day it won't be an issue. <laughs> and if I edit on YouTube and take that part out with the like microphone at the beginning, um, then you can't see the chat replay. So I don't know if that's important to people. I'm not really sure what you guys would prefer, but that's where we're at. So in today's show, I don't even have my show notes up. So let me get my show notes and um, we'll have a look at what we're doing today. I know I've got some uh, yarn statistics stuff to share with you. We've got some community participation stuff and um, I have some a new spin on the wheel that I thought that I would share with you because everything else that's on my wheel right now I've got I do have a project on my Magicraft and I haven't really talked about it on the podcast at all because it's plain white undyed organic pole worth and I'm just kind of spinning it when I have a chance but I have these other projects that are taking um, priority because I've got spinning to do for workshop which I've talked about on the show before and I also have some um, uh, how I spin content for the spring that I'm working through and I also have some sweet Georgia content that I'm working on so it's all like more time sensitive and it's stuff that's sort of more interesting to talk about on the podcast right now because plain white organic pole worth is not really that interesting. <laughs> so anyways, I appreciate that, Sarah, that you're not, that it's not a big deal. We were having sound issues yesterday when we were in the spin group. My The sound was going in and out. So do refresh because I know it's been an issue. Um, it was an issue in the wool stream and it's not at my end. I have checked. So I'm really sorry if uh, the sound is going in and out for you. Please, please refresh your um, stream. All right. Well, and actually I could change my... Um, my USB connection, but I also kind of don't want to play with it too, too much just in case... Um, things get really messed up. So if you guys are happy to sort of just be patient and maybe refresh if you need to, um, definitely do that. Okay, let's get into the show.
All right, so community participation. Um, we have had um, a giveaway running this month in the Ravelry group, and it is um, for the month of February, and I will be sending out four ounces of pin-drafted roving of Shetland from Disdero Ranch that's located here in British Columbia. And um, people, the question was asked by Amy, and um, her question to the community was, what is the item that you've made that you love to wear the most and why? And you guys have just totally taken up this torch and created an entire February episode thread, which is linked below in the show notes at wellforpearls.com or at patreon.com slash wellforpearls under episode 140. All of the uh, links are there. Um, and you guys have been sharing your projects and sharing photos. So every week for the next few weeks, we're going to share um, your projects. And next show, so the first show in March, I will share, um, I will do a, the giveaway winner. Um, but in the meantime, I've been sharing these on the podcast. So last week we heard from Michelle and this week we are hearing from Holly, which was post number three. Last week we did post number two. And this is Holly's most worn knitted item. It's the peeping cowl. I love this pattern. It is so pretty. Um, it's very me, and though it's a statement piece, it also styles easy with lots of looks. I made it to practice my jogless stripes. And just beautiful use of color, Holly. I think it's just absolutely beautiful. So we also have this. It's from the Handspun Thread in Ravelry, and this is an awesome example of a Zero to Hero project. So I know some people have been struggling a little bit about what to do for their Zero to Hero. And this was from Kaylee, episode, uh, post number 393. Uh, she finished up this shawl over the weekend. It was her first quote unquote endurance spin using two four ounce braids that she dyed herself. You don't have to dye your fiber if you're doing a Zero to Hero. It's just fiber to yarn to finished object. You can knit, weave, crochet, doesn't matter but it needs to be a finished object. Um, so she didn't have intentions of spinning them together, but she thinks the end result worked really well. I think it works beautiful, Kay beautifully, Kaylee. Um, I just love your yarn. And she's thrilled with the final results, and now she's planning out her next hand spun project. So that's fantastic. I'm not sure she actually said what the pattern was that she used for this shawl, but I recognize it. And if anybody in the chat knows what it is, um, Please don't hesitate to um, say what it was. Holly, we just shared your one of your projects from the uh, February episode thread um, to show people what their um, uh, what you wear the most and why. Um, and then we'll draw a giveaway winner next show for that thread. So please keep those coming. So thank you to Kaylee and Holly for um, sharing. That's just fantastic. So. Um, for our 51 yarn spin along, and actually I put away my book because it's been hanging out here on my on my desk. Um, we are doing a two year long 51 yarn spin along. For those who are long term viewers of the podcast, you guys will know all about this spin along. We have group A going, they're in their second year right now, and we have group B going that is just starting, and they are starting at the beginning of the book, and then group a is sort of halfway through the book right now. I would say we're sort of around yarns 26, 27 ish. And um, I, Becca posted this and um, this was her tweed yarn. And actually the reason why I wanted to share this today was because I'm gonna share my tweed yarn with you guys today. So um, this was her project and I wanted to share with you what she wrote. So this is group A. And um, this was post number 916, and I've linked this all, like I said, in the show notes. So she's all finished with the tweed yarn for this month. She has done so many striping and fractal yarns that she, I am not as excited for those, but tweed and hand blended gradient are really getting my teapot steaming. That just made me laugh when I read that when I was putting this all together, Becca. It's so British to say, I love it. Um, she says, I love tweed yarns and tweed fabric. I love their depth and the fabric that they create. This month's tweed is my second go, to go at hand blending a wool and sari silk yarn. I first did this last year and knew it would be something that I would try again. She took 25 gram samples of four different shades of merino for a total of 100 grams. 
She laid thin layers on each across her hand cards and then took a thumb la length of recycled sari silk and spread it across the top. She did two passes on the hand cards to roughly blend. She wanted it a bit chunky and then made roll legs. Just beautiful, Becca, and she's in the chat right now, so just gorgeous. I spun these on my flat iron doing a supported long draw with twist in the drafting zone at a ratio of 10.4 to 1. I did a pretty basic 3-ply after doing little samples of both 2-ply and 3-ply to see which I preferred. And Becca is a spinner of my own heart because she loves 3-plies as much as I do. So um, I, was, I, I thought this finished yarn was just absolutely beautiful and really nice in the 3-ply. She's got just a beautiful twist angle on that yarn. She totally loves this skein. The only thing she would change is to using a different wool. She got the merino fur, the amazing range of colors, but it's heavily processed and feels kind of flat. Not bad, just noticeable after all of the minimally processed farm fiber that she's been using recently. For now, this skein will become part of her spinning certificate portfolio, and after that, who knows? So Becca's currently working through a spinning certificate and she's been sharing a little bit of her progress in the Slack channel. And um, she's got all these different yarns that she has to spin. And this, this is just a gorgeous yarn, Becca. Really, really well done. She's also been spinning with no color um, for quite a while. Hey, Becca, I, I know you're in the chat, so I know that you can... Um, uh, let us know. And so she's like just recently been delving back into color and, and really enjoying it, which is really cool. So it's from the World of Wool, the um, and it's the Starry Night palette, she thinks, um, from World of Wool. So let's have a look at group B. This was Holly again. And actually the reason why I wanted to share this with you, and I have linked it in the show notes like I mentioned, but this was group B because they're still kind of getting going. So because it's February right now, they're looking at the down wools and the long wools. So I'll be sharing a little bit about that next show. Um, but she made a bullet style journal for her spin along. Um, and so she shared some photos in her um, Ravelry page of her knitter's journal, her knitter's bullet journal that she's been doing for years. And so I linked it down below and you can have a look because the photos of what her bullet journal looked like are really cool. So for those of you in the community that do bullet journaling, I thought this was just really inspiring because I know there are a lot of people in the community that bullet journal. Katrina bullet journals, Felicia bullet journals. And actually it's funny because I don't bullet journal um, because I keep a personal diary that I write in daily and I just find it gets to be too many places that I'm writing. Um, but my book for, um, my book for the podcast, you can see Nora has put a whole bunch of stickers on, um, is actually very bullet journal ish. Um, and so I have pages and pages and pages of, bullet journal style um, stuff that I'm keeping track of and it's all podcast related. Um, so it's funny because in the three, almost four years that we've been doing this, um, I've only actually filled up this much of the book. Um, but I go back and I reuse pages and I cross stuff out and I update stuff and um, I just, I think it's a really great way if you are into that type of journaling. It doesn't work for everybody, but if you're into that kind of journaling and that type of organization, um, it can be really inspiring. And I think for some people it can be um, a real uh, opportunity basically to chronicle and to, to document their progress and their, their stuff. So I finished a spin and I thought that I would share it with you guys because um, I've been finishing a lot of spins lately. <laughs> there has been copious amounts of spinning at this end and there has been copious amount of finishing at this end. So let me just finish, fix my webcam because it's um, I was playing with it earlier and I was moving things around and I was doing all the things. So um, this has been a very strange week here um, at, uh, at home. 
Um, I've had a really quiet week. As some of you know who are part of the Wool Stream, um, you guys know that I've been participating in a research study um, for the last four weeks. So tomorrow marks day 28, and um, I've got two weeks left on this study. Um, so, which has been fine, that's sort of been going on in the background. And then um, my brother and sister-in-law, who I'm very close to, and they're um, very, um, um, like integral parts of, of our of my life and of our life um, they are currently in the midst of a bit of a family emergency that started a week ago yesterday so my sister-in-law's mother has been diagnosed with end-stage pancreatic cancer and for those who um, know um, what's sort of happened in my family over the last six months, um, you guys will understand how close to home this all hits. So it doesn't really touch me and Mike's life because um, we are sort of that little bit more removed from the sort of situation itself, um, but very much um, aware of what's going on and very much, you know, looking to support my brother and my sister-in-law and all of this. And their kids are a little bit younger than our kids. So their eldest is the same age as our youngest. And then they also have a three-year-old. So kindergarten and and um, and three. So um, it's been a really strange week. Um, I'm actually feeling really super well. My mom is doing really super well. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot and really debriefing a lot. Um, just to sort of keep emotions and feelings in check and, and just checking in and making sure that we're all sort of, you know, not, not that we're all coping, but they're just that, you know, things are, that we're all looking after each other, I guess is the right way to describe it. But this week has ended up feeling really disjointed and really strange because they came over on the ferry unexpectedly on Thursday morning to sort of start to, you know, put together what the next number of weeks and months are going to look like and, it's, uh, yeah, it's just kind of created this like, you know, ripple in, in the effect. So um, in the in the fabric of life, this is life, right? Um, you can't control it. There's no, the more we try to control life, the less, you know, the more it becomes apparent and obvious that we have no control. And really it's, it comes down to, to how, we, how we manage it, you know, and what our response is. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's just been like a really strange week. And one of the ways that I um, deal with a lot of this stuff is by journaling and writing and my creativity. So I've been like banging off the, the hand spun yarn and just giving myself that opportunity to sit at the wheel and, and do that med moving meditation. And um, I utilize the um, app um, for those who are, who are into meditation. I use Headspace um, and I use it quite a lot. And so while I've been spinning, um, cause I, I'm, I've been working, doing these projects on my, on my e-spinner sitting here. I've actually been playing headspace, um, and doing like 15, 20 minute, uh, guided meditations. And it's been awesome. It's been so therapeutic. And, um, uh, my best friend and I got on the phone together yesterday afternoon and, um, she is such a light and she's not into knitting at all. She's not into spinning. She's not a maker. She's not creative at all. Um, and um, like her husband has a PhD in applied math and she's like totally math and science um, directed. And we had this wonderful conversation about control and our lack of control in our life. And the only thing is, is our way of um, responding. And we also um, talked a lot about joy and finding joy in our life and what it is that brings us joy. Um, and of course, over and over and over again. Of course, I mentioned all of you guys in the community and how much joy I get from all of this. So um, you guys are a light as well. So I wanted to share this yarn and I'll talk about my tweed yarn afterward. So, um, and we'll talk about this yarn in, in just a sec as well. So this yarn I finished. Um, remember I had just started the second bobbin and I was spinning everything to my Ashford e-spinner. So I was doing it all to one um, one bobbin because these Ashford bobbins are huge on the e-spinner, which is really great. I don't know exactly how much fiber they hold, but it's certainly, um, a lot. And, um, I have been, and so I had just started the second bobbin, this, the equivalent of the second bobbin, but I was spinning to the one and putting a chunk of fiber in between to divide them. And then I rewound them onto weaving bobbins 
um, to be able to apply from the first spun end. And this is Katrina's colorway, craftyjacks.ca. Um, and this is Fractured Dawn. And I can see, I tried to fix the camera over the weekend to get the color and the white balance correct and everything, but I can see that it's still not quite right. So I'll put it to the big camera so that you can see. So this is the yarn and um, it turned out beautifully. Like look at that twist angle. I'm so happy with it. It is a traditional three ply and the Fractured Dawn colorway that Katrina developed for our Finn study back in 2000, the fall of 2016 was really cool because it was um, space, like she poured the dye on randomly and left a whole bunch of white and what resulted, and then she put purple, green, kind of a camel colored champagne color and blue and they were all randomly placed and the result was this um, fiber that you know had the white that turned the dark purple and the green into pastels and then this one I spun up into a traditional three ply and I am currently knitting where did it go with the two ply fin that I spun for um, the fin study and this is my shift the shift cowl. So I'll talk about that briefly right now as well. So this is that yarn here. And um, you can see that like next to each other, they're quite different. So the fin, the colors came out quite a bit darker and with the Targi bamboo silk, which is this base here. So it's an 80, 10, 10. So 80% Targi, 10% silk, 10% bamboo. You can see how different the colors are. So the colors on the fin stayed a lot darker. Um, and this was a center pull two ply. I totally agree, uh, Eve. Um, I won't say it on the podcast what you wrote, but um, for those who can see in the chat uh, what Eve wrote, I totally agree. There's actually a whole campaign that that is that. Um, you, there's like sweatshirts and stuff if you Google that. Um, my friend Brody, when he was still alive, um, he was my, Mike, my husband's best friend. Um, he uh, died of um, a, a, AML, which is a, the type of leukemia that you don't want to get. It has like a 0.02% survival at five years. Um, he was very involved with that organization. So, um, oh, hi, Megan. I didn't see you in there. It's good to see you. Um, so this is my, my shift, um, the shift cowl. It's called the shift. And you can see up here that this is all of that uh, fractured dawn. So this is the Arctic berries colorway as the background all the way up to here. And in here is the lakeside colorway. which is this one. And this was a fractal two ply and the Arctic berries was a traditional two ply. And I've basically run out of that colorway. Um, I had to rip back on the shift cowl because I, um, so this is the seaming edge over here. And then you work to, um, where am I? I'm in the middle of a row. So I'm really sorry about that. That was really poor planning. Um, and then you start to decrease. So I'm just at the point where I'm, this is the point and where I'm going to start decreasing now. I took out one section to make it a little bit smaller because my gauge is a little bit bigger. Um, I'm knitting this on slightly bigger needles. And so I, um, yeah, so I took out one of the sections because the width across based on the measurements on the pattern, I'm, I'm there. So, um, I'm going to start decreasing now. And that will sort of utilize the rest of this and most of the lakeside as I work through the color repeats and um, get to a point where I am sort of towards the end. So this becomes the seaming edge here at the back of the cowl. And then you're working your way across. This is the neck edge up here. And then this will be 
the the point at the bottom at the front here so if you can kind of see that just for those who don't know that the, the uh, construction of this cowl that's sort of how it's how it's made so I'm working on the second half I just started the second half to mirror the first half so the uh, the Arctic berries is the background colorway for the first half and then the fractured dawn will be the background colorway for the second half and if I run out of yarn because I cut the yardage very closely with this um, it was a bit of a wing and a prayer to get this cast on and get it completely finished I have the combo plied yarn from the study that I can substitute in. So I'm not too worried about whether or not I run out of yarn. Um, in some ways, I kind of wish I had used that yarn for the background of the entire cowl. Um, but then on the other hand, the movement of the Arctic berries through the background of the first half is so pretty that I think either way it would have been really lovely. So that's that project. So this is the shift by Andrea Mowry. And for those who kind of have been following for the last few weeks, you guys will know that um, this pattern has been sort of in my queue and on my list for quite a long time. And this is part of my um, make nine for 2020. Uh, I also would like to make the shifty, which is the same pattern, but in a pullover. And um, I'm just sort of in the process of figuring that out and trying to decide if I'm going to spin for that or um, what I'm going to do, because that's been sort of in the back of my mind. And I've talked about that a lot on the podcast. I did some some sampling and some swatching for it. And I've kind of put it on the back burner for now because of everything that's going on. And I really, really want to work with this yarn next, which is for the School of Sweet Georgia and some content for us for wool and spinning. And um, you guys know as well as I do that you just, you can't do all the things. So the colors for the shift worked out beautifully. So thank you so much, Megan. Um, yeah, it's definitely, I think what makes the shift work really well, just because I've looked at so many of them on Ravelry and I've, uh, that are hand spun, and I've really been trying to sort of figure out what it is about the pattern that works so well. Um, and sort of analyzing the colors a little bit and trying to sort of figure that out. And I think for me, what I like the best is when there's sort of a certain um, homogeny to the colors. So like one of the things about the fin study that works really well is there's at least one color from the three colorways that Katrina had developed for that study that they have in common. So if you want to just hang on for a quick sec, And I will share with you, we'll just, let's delve into this a little bit because we have time. And um, I think for those who are planning to spin and knit this, it might it might be helpful. And if it's not, then, then that's okay too. So these were the colorways for the fin study, okay? So on the far on this on this far side is arctic berries and in the middle is the fractured dawn colorway and then on the far side over there uh over there at the very far end is lakeside okay so these were the yarns that we that katrina had developed these three colorways for the fin study and if you take a moment to look at them one of the things that that and the one of the reasons why these yarns work so well for a pattern like the shift where you're using three colorways and you're rotating through two of the colors at a time. So for each section, you're working with two of the yarns and the other one is sort of waiting to be worked in. Um, but if you look at these three yarns, for example, that Katrina developed for that colorway, at least one of the colors from the other two are in each of the colorways. So if you look at Fractured Dawn in the middle there, the green, that kind of foresty green that's in there, and the purple is the same colors that's in Arctic Berries right there, okay? So those two yarns, when knit together, while quite different to the untrained eye, they work together because they've got that same color, that same dye that Katrina developed and mixed. And then Lakeside has the red 
um, and that's kind of the color that separates it, that makes it sort of its own color. But it has the green and the blue from Arctic Berries, and the blue and the green as well, actually, that's in Fractured Dawn. So you've got these three colorways that are very different and lended themselves to being spun very differently. So Arctic Berries I spun as a traditional two-ply. Um, because if I had done a fractal, it, because of the dark purple and the dark red it, and the dark green, it would have kind of been lost. Um, the fractal wouldn't have really popped. So that was spun as a traditional two-ply. And then the Fractured Dawn in the middle with the white, because it was space dyed and it was kind of randomly placed color and it wasn't, you know, there was no rhyme or reason, there was no repeatable colorway. That was done as a center pole two-ply because it didn't matter how the colors matched up. I just spun it you know, stripped it down and spun randomly. And that worked really well. And then the far one, the lakeside, was a very repeatable colorway and the colors were quite different. Um, there was that really bright green in there and there was that really beautiful scarlet red. And it lended itself really beautifully to a two-ply fractal where you've got that repeatable colorway and you can see the movement of the stripe through the finished yarn. So spun differently, but highlighting their individual differences and then lending them to a pattern like the shift, for example, where you've got that natural striping where it moves through and you've got two yarns that you're using at one time per section. Um, it just works really super well. And I think where it breaks down are yarns that are too similar, yarns that are a different gauge, or yarns that are too different, um, so that there's too much of a contrast and it's too, um, it just doesn't have any kind of homogeny to it. Now in the shift cowl, your background color, um, cause I saw that Eve was wondering about the background color, does it stay the same? So in the shift cowl, your background color stays the same for the first half of the pattern, and then it stays the same for the second half of the pattern, but it's a different one. The shift sweater, the background color changes. And if you think of it sort of in like sections of three, that you kind of cross, make a cross section of the, of the pattern across the, the, the sweater. So it's like one third, one third, one third the background's color is the same for the first third and then it's different for the second third and different for the, the third um, section. Does that make sense? So I'm just gonna make sure that I'm not um, missing your guys' question. Same question about the background color. Does that answer that question? Does that help? So I could pull it out again and just show you guys, but basically the first half up to the the point of the cowl, um, that's the same background color and then it'll be the same background color for the other one. So again, you have to be aware of how much of a contrast you want because you'll end up with a line in the cowl. And if you don't like that, um, you want to think about how coordinated those yarns are and how related they are. Um, to create that overall movement and that overall sort of texture and interest without it being boring. Do you know, so a really good example of this, my brother and sister-in-law were remodeling their ensuite bathroom. They didn't have an ensuite bathroom and so they built one. And my brother's really super handy and he used my, my husband, Mike, a lot because Mike's really, really good at that kind of stuff. And um, <laughs> let me tell you, YouTube DIY videos go very far and my mom, who's an artist, and she's a studio trained artist and worked as a studio artist for years, she's a, an acrylic and oil painter, walked into their bathroom when she was over there, and this was like a year or two ago, and my sister-in-law had picked the tile for the shower, the tile for the floor, and the vanity and the countertop, and they were all in there in the bathroom, kind of stacked up and ready to go. And my brother had already tiled the shower and they had chosen one tile for the wall, the seat and the floor because it's a fully tiled shower bath, shower sort of com combo. There's not room for a bathtub. And they had the floor tile right there and the vanity had already been brought in and installed and then they had the countertop already installed. And my mom said to my sister-in-law, are you really set on that floor tile? 
And my sister-in-law was like, well, yeah, like we've already bought it. We've already like, yeah, like what, like what's the problem? And my mom said, if you take a step back and sort of let your eye blur, look at the bathroom and, and like, let's set out some of these floor tiles that you've picked and let your eye blur and sort of look, try to find somewhere to focus on, like somewhere that's contra that offers contrast, somewhere that offers interest. And Katie did that and she stood back and she kind of was like trying to get the hang of it. And my mom was sort of walking her through how to do that. And Katie said, well, there's nowhere to look. And my mom said, exactly. Everything is the same color. You've designed an entire bathroom, tile, floor tile, vanity, countertop. It's all cream. You have to put something different on the floor because the other things are already installed. So they ended up going with a slightly darker tile that kind of had like a, a gray undertone. It's very similar actually to the wood of the bench that these yarns are, are um, photographed on. And all of a sudden the bathroom became, there was depth and texture and interest and they chose a darker colored faucet as well. And it all of a sudden completely morphed the whole bathroom because there was somewhere to look and it offered depth and texture because up to that point, everything was too homogenous. So when it, bringing this back to yarn, um, that's where sometimes when we're looking in our stash for a pattern like this and we're having difficulty, sometimes it's because the yarns are like, too different and there's nothing to tie them together or they're too similar and your eye has nowhere to look in the knitted fabric. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's totally feasible to keep the background the same the whole way through. And actually, if I was gonna do this again, or when I do this again, because I'm gonna do the shift pullover, I actually think I'm gonna do that only from a yarn management, maximizing my yardage kind of a standpoint. Um, so I'm pretty sure that that's what I'm gonna do for the shift, for the shifty sweater is keep my background yarn the same the whole way through. Um, just for like homogeny. So yeah, when in the pattern, when she says to switch to colors B and C, just keep the background color, because you get a hang of how the pattern works after a while and you know which is your background color, you just don't change that color. You just keep using it through the entire thing. So you would basically knit color A through the whole thing and alternate colors B and C the whole time rather than alternating color A. Does that make sense? If you read the pattern, you'll understand what I mean. Okay. I just don't want to miss anything in the chat because I've been sharing, I've been talking and talking and talking. Um, and I just don't want you guys to, uh, I don't want to miss anything. Yeah, it's hard to sometimes see it in the moment. Um, and I think that's where practice comes in and having a community like this to bounce ideas. Um, we have that thread in Ravelry, in the Ravelry group that's for like spins in progress. And, um, I think for some of you like who are, you know, struggling to put yarns together or fiber together for some of these projects like that is absolutely the place to post some of that stuff and post those questions and queries and of course the slack channel is always um the place to ask questions if you um, are part of that tier on Ravel on patreon in quilting you choose say three colors and then take each one and go darker and each one and go lighter for that movement exactly yeah very very similar um, my mom does that all the time because she's a quilter. My mom's a beautiful sewer and um, that's something that works really, really well. Makes perfect sense. I plan on using two yarns, so we'll just keep the background and foreground colors the same. Absolutely, Eve. And you know what? I'm going to do that for the, for the shifty for the sweater. So um, we can work through that together if you have any questions. Um, and actually in spin group Eve, we can talk about that some more as well. Um, we had spin group yesterday. It was lovely. It was wonderful. We had lots and lots of fun. We are going to make some changes. Um, and I have posted that on patreon.com and I've also posted it on the blog at wellforpearls.com. So if you're interested in learning more about our virtual spinning group, it will now be an hour once a week and it will be on Wednesday mornings. So if that works for you, please hop on over and jump in because there is very, very, very limited space to to start with so um, it will be for an hour and we are using zoom for that for those who are familiar with that um, platform and it's been so much fun so much fun so I wasn't really sure what to expect 
and it was something that you guys have been asking for for quite a long time and it's just it's completely exceeded my expectations so um, this is not washed I forgot to say you could probably tell you guys are pretty smart people um, I it's all crinkly and everything still I didn't want to have wet yarn for today's live stream so I thought that I would um, wash it after we're done today because nothing is drying in our house um, it has been so cold here like unseasonably cold um, we've had a lot of rain and um, I've, I'm still wearing my winter jacket which is really unusual so I'm gonna pop this in the in the wash and I have started my other spin that is part of this larger spin so this is Katrina's colorway Pasuta and um, this is a really cool colorway. It's the one that was pictured for the thumbnail for the episode um, today. And I divided this all up yesterday. So this, so I took the braid and I split it lengthwise. So really long lengths of fiber as a result. And um, I, this will be spun, this first big bump will be spun end to end. And you guys can probably guess what I'm making. Um, this is going to be a three ply fractal. So all of these yarns that are part of this project are going to be three ply fractals. So the other colorway that I'm waiting for from Katrina, and I actually should be able to pick it up tomorrow. I'm hoping to get it on my way home from work in the morning because I'm working nights tonight, is Arctic Berries and her colorway um, Pacific... Pacific Blue, I think it's called. So these four yarns are going to go together into a project and they're all going to be three ply. And um, this is going to be a three ply fractal. So I've actually started it on the e-spinner and um, this will be, the. I've started with the four um, for the third bobbin first. So a, a fractal is basically just that, it's fractions of color. You can do two ply, three ply, four ply, it's up to you. This is gonna be a three ply like I mentioned. Um, so this is your first bobbin, this is my second bobbin, and this is my third bobbin. So my third bobbin I divided four times the fiber lengthwise, and for my second bobbin I only divided it twice, and then for your primary, your first bobbin, you, you don't divide the fiber at all and you spin it end to end. And the idea is that one of your singles is spun through the colorway repeat um, one time and then the other ones repeat through twice and then however many times you want it to repeat through. So I could have divided this four times and divided this six or eight times. I could have divided this six times and divided this like 12 or 14 times. I wanted to keep it simple though and so I limited the number of times that I divided the fiber. So I did it by, by twos. So no division, two and then four. Um, and part of the reason for that is I wanted to maximize where the colors matched up as much as possible. So this is the Pesuta colorway, P-E-S-U-T-A. And it's one of Katrina's, I think it's one of her like best colorways that she's ever developed. I absolutely love this. It has been in my stash since I got it. Um, I've been putting off spinning it because I love it so much. And this is her Targi Bamboo uh, Silk Blend. So that's why it's got the str streaks of white in there. That's the bamboo. And this was the same. This was the 801010, same thing, Targi Bamboo Silk. Really, really pretty. Oh, that's right, Becca. I'd forgotten that you'd spun the Pasuta before. I, rem I knew somebody had spun it in the community. Um, I just couldn't remember who. Can you show it on the other camera? Absolutely. I know the colors are off. So this is the colorway here. Does that help, Diane? I'll fix the camera for next time. What we might have to do is go back to the DSLR. It's just that it times out. So, um, yeah, I'll have to play with the webcam. But that's the colorway there. Isn't that beautiful? Browns and blues and reddy browns, gray. It's just beautiful. So, now the other thing that I um, have been working on, I'll move this out of the way is my Tweety toque for my sister-in-law. So this is for my sister-in-law whose mom is sick. Um, I showed this last week. I got her the What Would Jane Do little book of quotes for her because her and I are huge Jane Austen fans. And um, I didn't know they had made Emma into a, a, a new movie. So I'm so excited about that. And um, I knit her, this was my tweed yarn for our 51 yarns spin along. And this is the 
Oh my gosh, I was gonna say the honeycomb hat, but I'm actually not sure. Maybe it's not. The Hourglass Winter. The Hourglass Winter Hat by Cecily Clark. So twisted rib at the bottom and then you lift your stitches left and right. Um, I did use a cable needle. Um, you don't have to, you can just hold it with your fingers. And um, I put a label on just to cover up the seam where I joined, just because sometimes that's not as pretty. And I put on a pom for her because she loves pom poms. So very, very stretchy. I knit this on um, four millimeter needles from start to end. And um, it's super cute. I wonder if I can put it on without messing up my hair. So how cute is that? Yeah, and the, this is her favorite color, I should say. This is her absolute most favorite color. Um, she looks amazing in it. She's really, really pretty. And um, she, uh, I haven't taken photos of it yet but I will, and I will load them on my Ravelry page. So in the pattern, I think it says to um, increase to size uh, five millimeter needles, um, US size, I guess that's eight, um, but I didn't. Um, Katie does not have a really big head. <laughs> She's just like a normal sized head. So if it fits me, it'll fit her. And the yarn was actually quite, um, finely spun like it's it's more of like a sport weight even though the pattern calls for a DK so I felt like if I went up to the five millimeter needles it would actually end up being um, a bit loosely knit and um, this will stretch um, once it's sort of worn and gets a bit wet and it also means that she she has a ton of hair Katie has really thick 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 coarse blonde hair and um, it means that she can tuck her hair up into it and wear it sort of like, um, you know, wear it slouchy and whatnot. The cool thing about this pattern is actually the crown decreases. So they're done with garter stitch. So you finish up the pattern sort of where you're ready to finish. I think the pattern, it said to stop knitting at like 18 or 19 centimeters or something, but I actually ended up knitting to 22 centimeters just for that extra couple of inches of length because Katie has so much hair and it is so thick. And when it's tied up in a, in a bun or a ponytail underneath, you just need that room to still be able to pull your toque down over your ears. Um, so I did lengthen it by about two inches. And then you go into these garter stitch decreases, which are super simple. Oh, <laughs> that's awesome, Kath, that your daughter likes it. That's fantastic. So that's that's my tweed yarn all knit up that I did for the 51 yarn spin along. And those who get the monthly teaching content um, who are patrons of the show, um, you guys would have seen the vlog that was associated with this yarn and all of the information associated with it as well. So really fun to make. It was just stashed fiber um, and I used white sorry silk for the tweed that I carded and blended all together. And then I spun a two ply short backward, uh, smoothing the fibers as I went, two ply. I really love this yarn. I'm actually, so I wanna give this to her this weekend because it was her birthday last weekend and I had to rip it out and knit it again because I the gauge was wrong. That's why I didn't share it with you guys last week. And um, I kind of wanted to knit matching fingerless mitts to go with to go with the toque for her to kind of make a little bit of a set. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'll put this aside and I will do that for her for Christmas um, because I know that she'll wear them and I know that she'd really appreciate them. So that is my Tweety toque, and I'll take some photos and load those on my Ravelry on my Ravelry uh, page. So I rewound this yarn. I talked about this yarn last show. It's my finished falling leaves spin study um, from Sweet Georgia. Um, this was the Merino Alpaca Silk Blend, Superwash Targi and 100% Gotland. I love freshly wound yarn. Aren't these skeins perfect? They're just beautiful. So we had predicted last week that the yardage of the Superwash Targi was gonna be the highest and the most, and we were wrong. The yardage and the most 
is the alpaca merino silk. So the final yardage of this yarn was 512 yards, 125 grams, and it was a, a grist of 1,860 yards per pound. So 1,860 yards will, will create a pound, uh, will be created from a pound of this fiber. Oh, freshly, freshly uh, done skeins. They just make my heart sing. The Gotland was, we were right, it was the least amount of yardage. So this ended up being 344 yards of yarn for 125 grams. And the grist is uh, 1,250 yards per pound, which is right. It's a denser fiber. And they're both um, 14 wraps per inch. And the superwash targi was was um, high, but it wasn't as high as the alpaca merino silk. It was 468 yards from 125 grams, and it is 1,700 yards per pound. So a little bit denser than the alpaca merino silk, because that, which makes sense. Um, this is very very light very light uh, fiber. This is a little teeny tiny bit denser, but look at the colors. Oh, they just make my heart sing. I just love them. So I um, have all of my, this is sort of the progression of the fibers, which I just think is so fascinating. So this goes from the singles all the way across to the unwashed in the middle and then the finished washed yarns on the other side. So quite different. A um, little bit of bloom, not tons of bloom. And of course the singles, the original singles that I spun on this side. So you can see kind of how they morphed and changed through the spinning process. So the next step in this multi-breed, multi-yarn kind of experiment of mine um, is, and I've actually started writing the, the course content for our... Um, yarn substitution series that will start in the How I Spin vlog starting in April. Um, I'm working on that stuff right now and I've started writing the content for the School of Sweet Georgia. So the next step is to knit the swatches of the three yarns so that we can look at how the different swatches act and start looking at knitting patterns and what I want to do with this yarn. So pretty cool. They're not the same um, wraps per inch after after washing. They're close, but they are. The biggest difference was the Targi. Yeah, they're not actually that different. Now that I'm looking, I haven't actually done the wraps per inch yet. That was kind of the next thing on my list was the wraps per inch, twist angle, and twist per inch. They're not that different. Washed versus unwashed. I think the one that's the biggest change is the Gotland because of the fuzziness. The halo on the Gotland between washing and unwashing changed the most. And the one that changed the least was the alpaca merino. Like the, the two yarns are very, very, very similar. They didn't change at like at all. And there's really no bloom or poof. The Targi bloomed and it poofed which unfortunately you can't really see on here. They look very similar. But I saw a difference after it was dried. Um, so sometimes, you know, control cards like this where you've got stuff wrapped around is not super, super accurate sometimes. Now the next thing that I need to do is net my swatches and um, figure out needle sizes because I'm hoping that these yarns will knit up really nicely on 3.75 millimeter needles-ish, um, 3.5s or 4s. 4 would be ideal, 3.75 I'm willing to compromise. I'm hoping that that's where these yarns will knit up the nicest because um, I've got a couple of patterns in the back of my mind that would be easy to modify for that that are knit on 4 millimeter needles, so going down to a 3.75 would be okay. Um, and the other thing that I'm thinking about is um, the yarn statistics. So I need like wraps per inch, I need um, twist angle, I need uh, twist per inch, and I've done grist, I've done yardage, I've done weight. So yeah. 
really interesting to what gauge they knit up and also does Targi squish when knit to a smaller gauge or stay a lot. So Targi is funny because you can knit it quite tightly and it'll take it really well. It's like Polworth in that way. Merino, same thing. You can knit them quite tightly and they have a really nice finished fabric. Um, but you can also knit them a bit more loosely and, that, and sort of artificially create a little bit of... Um, uh, like a little bit of drape. So I'm curious to see how these will knit up because this will have beautiful drape. This will have beautiful drape. Um, and I don't know about this one. So I may have to play with the um, sequence of them because my original plan was to go from light to dark and knit them in this sequence. But I might have to knit them in this sequence so that this is the yoke and as you work your way down the sweater this becomes the bottom and this becomes the middle because the drape of these two might work a bit better in the body of the sweater so that's why i'm going to knit i'm going to do some swatching and figure it out cuz i don't i don't know i'm i'm we'll we'll find out I am going to weave some samples. I'm going to pull out my Zoom Loom and I'll do a sample of each. So I'll have a little square of uh, woven um, samples of these three as well. Yeah, that's a really great question, Diane, because yes, I am. Yep, just what one would expect from Targi. Absolutely, Becca. We've worked so much in this community with Targi and Polworth and um, some of these sort of bouncy fine to medium kind of fibers that I think many of us feel very comfortable with them and we're very comfortable predicting how they're going to act. Um, and I know that uh, sometimes the sort of wild card is, well, we know how this is going to act. So how's that going to affect how they work up, with, how it works up with these two? Um, I, that's the part that's sort of trying to, you know, figure it out. Do a cardigan, use the target for the button band stamp. So that's actually what I'm thinking, Eve. Um, I'm looking at the Comfort Fade Cardi. And if you guys have seen that, I'm not sure I can pop it in. Mm. I don't know if I have a photo of it actually, but for those of you who know the one that I'm talking about, I don't know if I... Because I know, I know there are a couple of you that aren't on Ravelry, but I also know most of you are on Ravelry. Yeah, I don't think I have a photo of it. Darn. It's a very cool cardigan. It um, basically has a shawl collar and um, quite a big shawl collar, actually. And it's a raglan yoked um cardigan and it fades between different colors of yarn so I think in the pattern it calls for um, four yarns I think but one of the colorways is only like it's only one skein um, and then the other th three you use two skeins um, like there's more yardage is what I mean for the other three so I think what I'm going to end up doing is substituting out the fourth color um, and just doing three colors and doing the fade with just the three colors. That's kind of my thought. So um, if you guys are happy to just um, hang tight for just a quick sec, I'll show you what I mean. You guys are so patient. I do love this new um, software. Oh, where did it go? There it is. Let me just pop it up for you guys. Oh, it's not coming up. Hmm. I don't know. It doesn't want to it doesn't want to show itself. Hmm. 
Weird. We are just having all kinds of technical difficulties today. Anyhow, it's a very cool pattern and um, I'll try one more time and then we can talk about it because I am planning on modifying this. That's why I want to share it with you guys. Okay, this is Andrea Mowry and this is the Comfort Fade Cardi. So this is what I mean about um, the movement of color. So you see how in her pattern she's got the um, that gorgeous teal yarn at the top of the yoke and then it fades as you move down and there's three other colorways that she's used for the remainder of the cardigan and what is really cool about that is that as you're doing that fade and as you're moving through those colors both on the sleeve and in the body of the cardigan um you've kind of got this like feature color if you will at the top of the yoke um and really that could be any of these. Um, you could have the Targi at the top and have sort of that bright hit of color and then it moves down into the gentler merino um, alpaca silk or you could have the Gotland at the top and have that darker um, color at, at the top of it and then have it move into the Targi and then into the merino and have that kind of more toward the bottom. My initial thought was to have them move through from light to dark. So the merino would be at the top and then into, or sorry, the merino would, the alpaca would be at the top and then the Targi and then you would have at the bottom the Gotland. You, you could move the colors any way. Um, and because it's sort of an open front, some people I saw at um, Fibers West and Knit City over the last couple of years, they've, they, some people add buttons, some people leave it unbuttoned at the front, but that shawl collar sort of allows you to do sort of whatever you want. Um, so because the yoke would be a little bit more structured, my my sort of initial thought was that you would that I would put the targi at the top. Um, and then have the drapier yarns be the body of the cardigan. That was kind of my initial thought. Yeah, exactly, Diane. Yeah, and then the hem area would be more drapier-ish. That's a word. Let's make it a word. <laughs> so that was sort of what I was thinking. And also because of the brightness of the Targi, that would really suit the top of the cardigan based on sort of how Andrea's done it. Um, and then it would move into the... Um, alpaca and then finish off with the gotland my concern is that it makes the bottom of the car cardigan very very dark um and i'm not sure that i love that so then i was also thinking you could start with the gotland move to the uh targi and finish with the alpaca at the bottom so you could do it that way or you could reverse it so that you start with the Merino at the top, Targi in the middle, Gotland at the bottom. So that's why we have to do some sampling <laughs> because I don't know based on the knitted fabric what is going to work the best. I think the reality is these three colorways very definitely go together. They look like they coordinate. They look like they're supposed to go together. The dyes are all the same. So the trick is... Um, optimizing where they're going to go in the cardigan for the best structure. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, Sarah. So it's like, do you want the do you want the the yoke to be the the sort of the focus? Do you want the an A line sort of hem to be the focus? Um, my sort of initial kind of thought is that you would sort of want more of the focus up top. Um, Andrea's not very tall um, in real life. I've I've met her in real life a couple of times at Knit City, and she's not a very tall person. Um, she's very petite. And um, she's very balanced in her shoulders and her hips are very similar in width. But I think for somebody, if you were like maybe your shoulders are a little bit wider or maybe your hips are a bit wider, um, if you're trying to sort of balance those things, that's definitely something that you'd want to think about. I'm an hourglass, um, so my shoulders are the same width as my hips. So for me, it doesn't really matter um, which get sort of augmented, if you will. Um, what I 
according to Amy Herzog, the best thing that I can do is actually emphasize my waist. Um, and so there is that in the back of my mind that putting the merino, alpaca merino in the middle and kind of having that, that shaping there um, would probably be um, something to think about. But I also don't really want to make my hips and my shoulders look really super big. So this is all stuff that is important to think about. So, oh, bye, Kath. Have a great week. These are all things to think about when you're substituting yarns in these commercial knitting patterns. And the more that you want to work with your hand spun and the more that you want to spin to use your hand spun, these are all really important things to think about. And I know for some people it's like too overanalytical. It's like, oh, that just doesn't resonate with you and that's totally fine. Um, but I think it's important for uh, me to share with you my process and what I'm going through when I'm thinking about this stuff so that um, it creates a more, um, sort of it gives you that bigger picture. Because I don't sit here and go through this stuff like cognitively necessarily. I think sometimes I actually do this unconsciously because um, it makes me sound like I'm really obsessive about how I want all this to play out. But really it's just part of the process. Um, that's actually what I was wondering, Suzanne, was because of my coloring that the medium would look the nicest at the top of the uh, cardigan up here. Um, kind of go from this. I don't know. Maybe the gauntlet needs to go at the top and then the, and then the, the targi and then the, do you know what I mean? It looks nice with this shirt that I'm wearing. <laughs> New outfit. Um, so I don't know. Let's do swatches and I'll have those for you next week and you guys can tell me what you think. All right, I think that's it for today. I need to get to bed because I am working tonight. So I need to go and have a really quick nap. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for sort of seeing, you know, getting through the technical difficulties at the beginning of the show. Um, I will play with the mic this week and see if we can keep it from, I, I don't know that I'll be able to completely fix the sound cutting in and out. I suspect that's a YouTube issue, but um, I'll play with the mic and make sure that uh, we don't have uh, sound issues going forward and have silence at the beginning of the podcast. So I appreciate your uh, continued um, patience with some of that stuff. Yeah, Kelly, I think I'm kind of leaning toward the dark one at the top as well. Have an awesome week. You guys have a great weekend. I hope that some of you will be joining us in our spin group next Wednesday. Again, please have a look at Patreon for more information. They are going to be a full hour um, each week um, and we're going to be doing some like sample alongs and swatch alongs and make alongs and spins and also just coming together for the social as well. It's just awesome to get in the same room, if you will, quote unquote, and uh, have conversations. And like I said, there is limited space available at this point. So if it's something that you're interested in, even if it's just to give it a try for one month and see what you think, um, please hop on over um, and secure your spot. So have a great day, great week. Enjoy all the making and thank you so much, you guys, for your patience. I am behind a couple of weeks in adding timestamps to the podcast so that people can skip ahead and get, go to exactly what it is that they want to talk about. Um, but I will get that fixed up this weekend, hopefully, and catch up. And um, until next time, happy spinning, happy knitting, happy all the things. Bye, guys.